In today's lecture, we're talking about the genera Francisella and Brucella, two very important groups of potentially zoonotic organisms that people can become infected with through the food supply, contact with infected animals, or even water. Both of these genera are small, gram-negative coccobacilli. Brucella species stain with the modified Zeal-Nelson stain, which is a really convenient way to identify these organisms. They show up as bright red coccobacilli in clusters against a blue background, which really helps to highlight their presence. These are all biocontainment level 3 organisms, which pose a very real zoonotic risk, both to people in contact with infected animals and also laboratory workers. Francisella is an obligate aerobe, while Brucella is aerobic but also capnophilic, likes to be in a CO2-enriched uh, environment. The genome of Brucella is unique. Um, unlike most bacteria, uh, Brucella contains two chromosomes. Of course, there is an exception. Brucella suis biovar 3 only has one chromosome. All of these organisms are intracellular parasites, and they're found in a wide variety of animal species. Francisella are small coccobacilli, and they often appear as singletons. So in this gram stain image here, you can see all of these small uh, pink uh, bacterial cocci. Because this organism is zoonotic and potentially quite dangerous, it's considered to be a potential agent of bioterrorism, and so it's gained a lot of attention from the defense community for that reason. In this picture, you can see a gram stain of a pure culture of Brucella species. Um, this particular culture was actually grown from a bovine fetus here at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine, and this slide is from a very old archival collection of slides uh, that was found at the WCVM. Um, and we know it's old and archival because Brucella has been eradicated from our domestic herd. So this slide is decades and decades old, fortunately. As far as the natural host and habitat goes, um, each of these organisms has its own host predilection, and also it's found in a particular geographic region. Francisella tularensis, we associate primarily with northern countries. It's endemic between 30 and 70 degrees north. And so we find it most commonly in North America, Scandinavia, Russia, and Japan. This is an organism that you should associate with rodents and lagomorphs. Um, in North America, we think of it being present in beavers, squirrels, rabbits, uh, and wild hare. But it can be found in a wide variety of species. It has an incredibly broad potential host range. So really any mammals, birds, even reptiles and fish have been found to be infected with Francisella tularensis. Brucella species are host associated, and it's a group of organisms which, at least in North America, have a low burden of disease. Globally, it has its highest incidence in Syria. Um, we also see Guatemala, Costa Rica as high prevalence regions in the Americas. Host associations for Brucella really depend on the species and sometimes even the biovar. So Brucella abortus um, has a preferred host of cattle, but it can be found in a wide variety of other species. Melatensis, we primarily associate with small ruminants. Brucella suis, at least biovars one, two, and three uh, are most commonly found in pigs, as the name would suggest. Biovar 4 is found in caribou and biovar 5 in wild rodents. And then the hosts where Brucella canis and ovis are most commonly found are really indicated by their names. Within the genus Francisella, we have nine species and 25 species of Brucella. Um, some of our Brucella species are divided into biovars, um, and these can be identified uh, based on some specialized testing. So they are differentiated by the requirement for CO2, the production of hydrogen sulfide, their ability to grow on various selective media, and also the presence of particular surface antigens. Despite being relatively well studied, uh, the virulence of Francisella tularensis is really poorly understood. It's an intracellular pathogen, so it primarily affects macrophages, 
Um, it's able to escape the phagosome and then replicates in the cytosome. Um, its ability to cause disease is thought to be due to its ability to multiply in uh, to high numbers in the tissues. These organisms are also encapsulated, which helps it to evade complement and perhaps phagocytosis. Rucella species also lack classical virulence factors, and they also don't have genes associated with horizontal uh, gene transfer. They're able to enter macrophages and prevent lysosome fusion through the LPS O-chain and cyclic beta-1-2 glucans. They also possess fur B and type 4 secretion systems, which interfere with lysosome function. We associate these organisms with a wide variety of diseases. So Francisella tularensis, in any animal species that we identify it in, causes a disease called tularemia. The clinical presentations of our Brucella species are somewhat more host-specific. So Brucella abortus is primarily associated with reproductive losses in our large ruminants, so abortion and orchitis in cattle. In other ruminant species, pigs and camels, we can see sporadic abortion. And in people, cause a syndrome called undulant fever. Brucella melitensis causes abortion in our small ruminants, so sheep and goats. In cattle and camels, it causes occasional abortion and it's excreted in the milk. And in people, this is the agent of Malta fever. Brucella suis causes abortion, orchitis, and osteomyelitis in pigs. In cattle, it's excreted in the milk. And in people, it also causes undulant fever. Brucella canis causes abortion, epididymitis, and discospondylitis in dogs, and potentially undulant fever in people. And then we have some newly recognized and emerging species of Brucella, pinnipedalis, in marine mammals, which has an unknown clinical significance, Brucella microti in voles, which causes systemic infections, and the very recently recognized Brucella, Brucella uh, inopinata, which in frogs and toads um, seems to be associated with cutaneous infections, but we still don't know a lot about it. We're going to start with Francisella tularensis, so the agent of tularemia. Uh, it was first recognized in Tulare County, California, so hence the name. And this organism is notable for its very low infectious dose. It's thought that it only takes between 10 and 50 organisms in order to cause disease. Francisella as a genus are actually endosymbionts of ticks, so they're associated with arthropods, and they can be spread by arthropod vectors. So in, in our region, Dermacenter variabilis, Andersoni, Amblyoma uh, americanum, as well as deer flies. Within these arthropods, uh, we see vertical transmission. We can also see transmission through direct contact with an infected animal or ingestion of contaminated water. Dogs and cats infected with Francisella tularensis can be treated with antimicrobials. Um, streptomycin is the treatment of choice in people, and we would likely use similar drugs in our companion animals. When you think about Francisella tularensis, I want you to think of the sources as arthropod vectors, rodents and lagomorphs, and potentially the environment. Later on in the lecture, uh, the reason for the picture of this uh, person with a lawnmower will be much more obvious. While Francisella tularensis has a broad uh, host range, there are differences in susceptibility between species. Cattle, pigs, and dogs seem to be the least susceptible, well, among our veterinary species, cats are probably the most susceptible. Disease occurs following an incubation period of approximately 48 hours, and this typically occurs after oral exposure. In dogs, we see anorexia and a low-grade fever, potentially also ocular signs, including uveitis and conjunctivitis. And there have been reports of sudden death um, following a dog sniffing a dead rabbit. In cats, we see fever, depression, lymphadenopathy, and splenomegaly, and they oftentimes have ulcerations in the mouth or on the tongue, um, most commonly associated with ingesting uh, dead infected rodents. These are some pathological images of a cat with Francisella. Um, on the left, you can see bilaterally symmetrical lymphadenitis, so this is on the lower jaw, so these large lymph nodes um, in the region where the body first encountered Francisella. On cut section, uh, necrosis of the lymph node was observed. Clinically, tularemia in cats can actually appear quite similar to plague, so Yersinia pestis, with fever and lymphadenopathy. 
So knowing the distribution of these pathogens in your area of practice is really, really important. Francisella tularensis is an organism that we oftentimes associate with wildlife. Um, here in the prairies of Canada, we think of the beaver as being a, a commonly infected species. And on the left here, what you can see is hemorrhagic intestinal necrosis. So these very angry, reddened, uh, fibrinous looking intestines on the left and granulomatous peritonitis on the right. In people, the incubation period for tularemia is two days to three weeks, so it's quite variable. Um, there's a number of forms of the disease that really depend on what the root of infection was. Ulceroglandular tularemia is most common, and in these patients, we see ulcerations at the site of inoculation, so the bite or the scratch, or where the organism gains entry to the body. We then see acute onset fever, chills, headache, a sore throat, and sometimes diarrhea. And the lymph nodes may separate, so you can get abscessation of the lymph nodes. Glandular tularemia is the next most common, and this is essentially lymphadenopathy without external signs, so there are no obvious skin lesions. People who are at greatest risk of tularemia are hunters, large animal veterinarians, and farmers, so those who are most likely to be working with animals and potentially uh, interacting with wild rodents and lagomorphs. A bizarre form of tularemia, so pneumonic tularemia, has also been associated with gardening and landscape work. And in this really landmark paper from the early 2000s, the use of a lawnmower was found to be an important risk factor. The reason for this is that people had run over animals which had died of tularemia with a lawnmower, aerosolizing the bacteria and allowing them to breathe it in directly. So do not use your lawnmower as a way to dispose of carcasses you find in your yard. In this map on the left, you can see the distribution of human cases of Francisella tularensis in the United States just in 2020. So there's uh, a handful of cases that occur every year. And on the right, you can see a person with a Francisella tularensis cutaneous ulcer. Here in Western Canada, we do have potential reservoirs of Francisella. So whether it's these uh, wild hares that we have, or a variety of tick species, we could potentially be exposed, and cases in neighboring regions have certainly been reported. This is some data from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, what you can see is the number of cases of tularemia seen annually on the y-axis over time, so from 2002 up to 2021, and I think you can appreciate that in the last uh, five to ten years, we've had around five cases per year. So it occurs in Canada, but it's not terribly common. Next, we're going to talk about brucella, and we're going to start with brucella abortus in cattle. Through a lot of hard work and pain, um, an eradication program in Canada that began in the 1940s um, has led to us being brucella abortus free in our domestic cattle herd. Um, the last known infected herd was identified in the province of Saskatchewan in 1989, and we've worked really hard to maintain this brucella-free status. It's really important for public health, and it's also really important for trading relationships. While our domestic cattle herd is brucella abortus-free, it is still present in wildlife populations, so particularly in Wood Buffalo National Park in Alberta and the Northwest Territories. In cattle, brucella abortus primarily affects the reproductive system. Um, it has a special affinity for the ruminant placenta, and so we see abortions. In males who are affected, we tend to see orchitis and epididymitis, so infection and inflammation of the testicles and epididymis. And we can also see synovitis, so it can settle out in joints and cause hygromas. In these images here, you can see um, tissues from an animal which aborted. Um, the first two images are the placenta. Um, here you can see uh, a necrotizing placentitis. We have necrotic uh, cotyledons with a bunch of sort of debris and degenerative material visible both on the cotyledons and between them. In this image, we have necrotizing placentitis in a buffalo. So this large sort of friable, uh, dry looking mass on the placenta. And then finally, we have fibrinous pleuritis. So these are the lungs of an aborted fetus. And I think you can appreciate that surrounding these lungs is this thick layer of 
fibrinous material. So this deposition of proteins that has almost like a scrambled egg-like consistency to it. Transmission of Brucella abortus is highest after parturition, so there's large amounts that are shed, and infection occurs through ingestion, um, either of milk or potentially also of those uh, fetal membranes and placenta, or through penetration of skin or intact conjunctiva. Brucella abortus is able to survive in the environment for uh, a number of months, and so grazing on contaminated pastures is potentially a risk factor. We can also see transmission through artificial insemination when semen is used from infected bulls. In Canada, we do not treat Brucella abortus. Um, the first thing you're going to need to do if you suspect a case is to call the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Uh, the response to an infection is going to be dictated by regulation and is likely going to be to stamp it out. So any uh, infected and potentially in contact animals are going to have to be humanely euthanized. Outside of Canada, um, it's a very difficult infection to treat. It's intracellular, and so there's a major pharmacokinetic challenge of getting adequate drug concentrations to the site of infection. Next, we're going to talk about Brucella melitensis. Um, this species has never been found before in Canada, so that is a really good thing. Um, it's primarily associated with sheep and goats, and we see it most commonly around the Mediterranean region. Um, although it is found really throughout the global south. In infected sheep and goats, abortion late in pregnancy is the most obvious sign, um, and the organism can hide out in the lymph nodes that are associated with the mammary glands, so we get shedding of Brucella melitensis in the milk for potentially even years. This is a really important reason why we pasteurize milk and need to be, need to be careful about raw milk and cheeses made from raw milk. Transmission is through contact with the placenta, milk, or vaginal discharge. In rams and billy goats, uh, Brucella melitensis manifests most commonly as uh, epididymitis and orchitis. So here we have a cut section of the testicle and epididymis of a ram. So here we have the testicle and the epididymis. And what I think you can appreciate here is this area of granulomatous inflammation in the epididymis, this accumulation of material associated with a Brucella melatensis infection. In people, Brucella melatensis is the cause of Malta fever, and it's named Malta fever because of where the disease was really first studied. So Themistocles Zamet was the person who really elucidated how Brucella was transmitted between animals and people. In Canada, again, if we identify Brucella melatensis, or if you suspect it, your first call needs to be to the CFIA. This is a foreign animal disease, and we do not want it in our domestic herd. In endemic regions, control really relies heavily upon hygiene, so cleaning up after lambing or kidding, and potentially vaccination to prevent infections in animals which are exposed. Mm -hmm.